Uh, before we begin, if I can ask the brothers to come in front of the camera, please try and make an effort. If you're able, not on a chair, please try and stand up. Come as far forward in front of the camera, and even the brothers in front of the camera, please, you can fill up these spaces in front. It just reduces the amount of commotion during. So I could ask you, if you can, please come up. My dear brothers, towards the side, towards here, please try and fill up on the stage from now. I'd be very, very, very grateful into this white space right here, this space just here, this space just here. Please, please do come up. Aflaha man salla ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa jalla. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan illa'in ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursaleen. خاتم النبيين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المذلومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين وصلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا حجة الله يا ابن الحسن يا صاحب الأسر والزمان اللهم صل على محمد إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد My dearest elders, brothers, sisters, salamun alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine messengers from the Anbiya through to the Imma alayhim salam and even amongst their companions have consistently guided us towards observing moderation in all things in our life. When you study the Islamic belief system, and you're learning about whether man has free will or if everything is predestined we're told even in that moment don't take any extreme paths Islam is the middle way Islam promotes a balanced moderate way of living Islam is never a proponent of over excessiveness and if we were to analyze tribulations that have taken place in history very often you'll find that a big cause, a first cause as to why this tribulation has occurred is a degree of excessiveness from an individual, from a group of individuals or even from a country or a continent or an institution or something. For example, someone's extreme greed has led them to invade yet another country to get more raw materials from that country that otherwise may not be using them to the full potential that that economy or country thinks that they can. And we see that left, right and centre. We see the jokes that if there's a bottle of oil, America's coming to take it, right? They usually have that picture, I don't know if it's come around here, where it'll be like a curry and they're like, America's on its way, you know? Oil, they're in. Someone's extreme ego, maybe they don't need those resources, maybe just for political reasons, they'll incite a war because that rallies people together in the country it makes them look like a grand leader they get to lobby some of the polit some of the uh, um, defense companies who make so much money in these economies and they rake in the votes and one i guess that's a bit more closer to home i don't mean that literally but you'll understand when i explain it is an extreme understanding of the faith where groups like daesh would come along and take a line of quran take an extreme viewpoint on it and suddenly the blood of those who pray to the same Lord that they claim to pray to is now legitimate, is now wajib on them to kill us. That these morning gatherings that we hold, it's now wajib on them to come and kill us. Extremist mindsets, be that in affluency, in expenditure, in belief, in diet, in anything, is never recommended by any professional in that field. But it's not just historical crises where this is covered. Excessiveness has also affected our homes, has also affected our communities, has also affected what we discussed yesterday, our youth. I ask you, how many divorces are we seeing in today, today's day and age? I'm not sure about here in Pakistan, but I know at least on behalf of the UK, 
It's a crazy number. Some even reporting beyond 50% of marriages are seeing divorces. Beyond 50%. And sometimes when you look into the detail behind them, what's happened? And there could be a lot of different factors, but it wouldn't be surprising for you to hear some of these factors. One, for example, could be excessiveness with regards to one of the spouses wanting better quality gifts. Oh, you don't look after me well enough. One of the spouses saying, oh, you don't do enough for me in the house. It's not clean enough. It's not like this. I expect it all this way. Another spouse will say, you don't let me visit my family twice a day. Even marriages that haven't yet taken place, marriages that could have been flourishing couples for the community, blocked by stakeholders in that marriage due to excessiveness. He must earn this amount, otherwise I won't consider him. Excessiveness. He must have this type of property or even properties, poor guy. Otherwise we won't consider him. She must have this, and this one's gonna hurt maybe. She must have this race, otherwise we won't consider her. Excessive in our demands for wealth, for beauty. We can seek, of course, taqwa, but being excessive in race, in color, in beauty, in money, in wealth, in assets, in, oh, he hasn't got a master, hasn't got a masters. No chance. This guy's going to be doomed to be a failure. How many friendships have even broken down due to excessiveness? We used to go out every day and now you no longer see me. You don't call me twice a day. You don't call me three times. Relax, man. Just because I didn't call you twice, that doesn't mean I hate you. We have this tendency to become excessive in our relationships. Obsession over certain things that suddenly drive us away from one another. Humans are not naturally meant to be excessive. They're meant to be balanced. And the Quran promotes this concept of balance, even of moderate dialogue. When you're engaging with someone who is, for example, an atheist that denies Allah's existence, we're taught to be moderate in our reply with them, not excessive. To be calm, to be relaxed, to have better arguments. We see moderation even in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has built the world in agriculture. You can't take a crop and overwater it. It's just gonna die. You can't take a crop and overexpose it to sunlight. It's just going to die. There has to be a balance in everything that we see. And Imam Ali is reported to say the ignorant are always extremists. Be that in provision of surplus or a deficiency. So we'll see both sides today. A surplus in something or a complete lack, a deficiency on the other. And there's a really lovely Middle Eastern idiom like saying that I came across. And it talks about carpenters. And carpenters have three types of cutting tools available to them. The first is an axe. You chop that wood and it leaves all of the chippings right in front of the carpenter, right in front of him. You then have a tool known as a plane, which pushes the wood shavings away from the carpenter. So in the first instance, it's right there. Then you have the plane which leaves the wood chippings far away. Then you have the saw, which leaves some sawdust close to the carpenter and it also pushes it out because of the direction. Teachers of ethics would advise their students to be like a saw in their lives. Don't be too much to one way, don't be too much to the other. Find the middle ground, find a balance. One of my teachers, when I look back on all of like our classes that we go through, he somehow always alludes to it. Don't be that guy who's like, tabligh, 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 and your family is suffering in the background. And I too had to check myself. Having honest conversations with my wife, she's like, you're out three, four nights a week. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, but it's tabligh, it's tabligh, of course. But in reality, you're like, no, I can't leave my house behind. In the same way, I can't just be focused on my house and never focusing on the community. In the same way, I can't lock myself in a cave for years after year after year after year in supplication and, in the set and never meet society and try and help. In the same way, I can't just constantly be saying, I'm volunteering, I'm volunteering, I can never sit in the majlis. No, at some point, you have to balance it. Ten nights, okay fine, five I'll serve, five I'll remain. Not nine I'll serve and one I'll remain. Or even the mistake that I made as a youngster because I hated sitting through lectures, so credit to you for sitting through mine. Ten nights, anything I could do to not sit in the majlis for the lecture, I'd do whatever it takes. 
Shoe rack needs moving, I've got no muscle, I'll still move the shoe rack somehow. Anything to get out of the lecture. Excessiveness in too much of one direction. So moderation applies to our daily lives. And in Charlotte today, we want to explore seven different parts of our life where moderation is critical. The first two, you're probably gonna guess are coming, sorry. The remaining five may be a bit of a surprise. The first one is expenditure. The second one is livelihood. The third is in worship. Yes, excessiveness in worship. The fourth is in the appreciation of others. The fifth is in promptness or procrastinating, being the other side of it. The sixth in speech and silence. I should probably listen to that one. And the seventh in hope and despair. And if we can adjust our way of living together as a community and find a balance, find an equi equilibrium like economics constantly goes on about, like the nutritionists always say to me, Sadiq, you need a balanced diet. You can't eat meat and chips every day. It doesn't work. Okay. You can't just eat salad the whole time either. You need some protein in you. You need a balance. If we can find a way to be balanced in our social interactions and in our interactions with our Lord, then inshallah we can find a thriving society that can contribute to the youth and their upbringing that we mentioned yesterday. If you'd like to go on this journey together, thanks to the works of Sayyid Father Milani, I ask you to offer a salawat in his honor. Salla ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. So as I mentioned, you're probably thinking ex excessiveness, here we go, here comes the expenditure talk, here comes the spending talk. And yes, we'll begin with it, we'll get it out of the way because I know we've mentioned it a little bit in these last few nights. But it's not me that's saying it, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's saying it. So it has a pretty good amount of credibility. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a verse in Quran, he puts forward to his servants the most significant characteristics that we need to be aware of, that we need to familiarize ourselves with. And he encourages us to believe in them. And this is in Surah 25, verse 67. Allah says, when they spend, they are neither extravagant, nor are they wasteful and stingy, because they follow a middle path between these two extremes. It couldn't actually be more clear cut. I know sometimes when we read the Quran, we're like, what on earth does that line mean? And we have to consult scholars. And we should always consult scholars who have had the science of knowing how to derive understanding from the Quran. We shouldn't do it. We shouldn't infer incorrect meanings. We should always refer to them. But sometimes the Quran, whilst this verse no doubt will have many, many, many layers of meanings, it speaks to the average brain like mine. When they spend, they're neither extravagant, nor are they wasteful or stingy, because they follow a middle path between the two extremes. They follow a middle path. And there's plenty of references about this extravagant spending. 1727, those who squander resources are considered to be the brothers of shaitan who is ungrateful to his Lord. The brothers of shaitan. The brothers of shaitan. This isn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, I think I, I used to think that when Allah says this, he's like, bashing down in his creation. No, he's trying to wake us up to say, look how dangerous this is for your soul. Look how far away from truth this act could take you. He tries to wake us up with these comparisons. On the other hand, Allah warns us of being stingy in 1729. Do not be miserly and worthy of disappointment or disapproval, nor so generous as to render yourself destitute. If you have, give. But don't give to the point where you then mess up your own livelihood. You need to find a balance. And we've seen people be excessively miserly with what they have. Allah gives them so much and they just hoard. They need to save. I can't give away any of this. I need to think about my future needs. I'm going to become poor if I don't. Dude, you've got millions in the bank. You haven't got a mortgage to your name. I think you're going to be okay. No, 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 I need to hold on to it. Do you really need all of those t-shirts and jumpers as my wife always tells me? I'm like, yeah, you know, you never know. Primark may shut one day. I need to have all of my regular fit black shirts ready for Muharram. So I think, I think 20 is more than enough. No, but just in case, just in case. I learned about a beautiful technique from one of the students in Qom, where I think he learned it from one of his teachers but he wanted to instill this concept of not hoarding amongst his two children. They're like, at the time when he told me, I think his daughter was about three and the son was maybe about five or six. So very young, trying to instill these values. He had set with his wife a khums date for this child, 
for each of the ch children, sorry. And on that day, they'd each go to their rooms, pick out the toys that they no longer play with and the clothes they no longer need, put them into bags, and then they'd go out themselves and give them to those who need it. From day dot, they're being encouraged not to hoard. You may think you'll need this for a rainy day, but don't worry, you can give it away. Such that when they start to earn, they're not going to hoard that money. They're not going to be scared to give that khums of 20%. I heard a phrase the other day, someone saying, khums, yeah, we'll give it when the imam comes, we can give it into his hands. But for now, we're not going to do so. I was like, what? Is this a thing? Allah is trying to protect his servants. I don't want you to hold on to all of this. Because you'll start to take it as your Lord. You'll start to take this expenditure as your Lord. Emir al-Mu'mineen reports say, I'm surprised that the miserly imagine that they can escape poverty as they tumble head over heels into it. You think you can run away from poverty? No chance. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be. And in fact, Allah even tells you in the Quran, Ya ayyuha nas, antumul fuqara'u ilallah. Oh people, you're needy unto Allah. Anyway, you're poor unto Allah. This money is nothing but some kind of visage that you think is going to protect you. In this life, they live as poor people. But in the hereafter, Allah will access their wealth and hold them accountable for the manner in which it was accumulated. Imagine your bank statement gets exposed to the community. Oh my God. How many times did you visit that shop? How many jewelry sets? For me, how many perfumes are they? Surely one was enough. 10 was plenty, 20 was ridiculous, 30, what happened to you, bro? What's scary is that expenditure, excessive expenditure is like a drug. We felt it. When you buy one thing, it's nice to buy another. It's nice to buy another. But for those of you who've understood it, who've studied economics, you'll understand the marginal utility of something, right? There's a curve. You buy your first car, crazy utility, buzzing. Let's say like 10 points out of 10. You buy a second car, eight points you buy the next car seven points and you just see this curve diminishing diminishing every car you buy it still gives you a tiny bit of satisfaction but it's diminishing in its return but you're addicted to it you want another one another one another dress another game another 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 and in 2009 a study was done and it was under the name of the symbolic power of money you can find it in the journal of psychological science and it basically concluded on this point, that as far as your brain's concerned, money can act as a substitute for social acceptance, reducing social comfort, and by extension, physical discomfort and even pain. And a researcher commentating on the study, they made another conclusion, and they said something startling, that money even works as a substitute for another pain buffer. And what was that? Love. The youngsters will know when I say the phrase gold diggers. Maybe the elders as well, I'm not sure. It's kind of what it sounds like. You're digging for gold. You're trying to find the person that's got the cash. The moment you no longer have that cash, you won't see those invites coming to those gala dinners anymore. <laughs> you weren't useful. Your money was useful. That's where your reputation came from. And it can change overnight. Before we go on to our next point, we've just been asked if we can move forward and allow more brothers and sisters into the Majalis. Again, we'll mention the name of our weighted savior and kindly take three steps forward, fill up all the white gaps. Rahim Allahum and Qa'im in Ali Muhammad. In the love of Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam, salla ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. And to ease the heart of Umm Kulthum and Lady Umm Al Benin, Aflahman Salla Ala Muhammadin Wa Ali Muhammad. Expenditure. We're done with that one, don't worry. We can all sit, sit comfortably again. Livelihood is the second one that Sayyid Fadl points to. Again, calling towards moderation. And this is in regards to earning our livelihood. And this was a lesson that I learned the hard way. 
there's a balance to be had. Neither do you want to be negligent in saying, you know what, Allah's going to provide, so I'm going to sit on the couch and wait for the money to come in. But in equal measure, we don't want to exhaust ourselves in pursuit of our livelihood, such that we leave behind all of our other responsibilities because it's, I have to close the deal, I have to close the deal. Focusing on working harder to acquire greater wealth was actually not approved by the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor by the imma. In fact, we see in an advice from Amir al muminin to, to his dear son, Imam al-Hassan al-Mujtaba alayhi salam Allahumma salli ala Imagine a father to son advice from an imam to an imam. My son, be aware that provision is of two kinds. One that you struggle to attain, the other that comes to you without the expenditure of any effort at all. You do not have to strive for it to come. Go work. Ensure you can pay your bills. But at some point, Allah will provide. At some point, Allah will provide. And there's this famous concept. It was, it was written in like a Farsi poem. So I've, the translation was there, but it didn't quite come across. I've taken the liberty of trying to explain it a little bit more. It's like a fisherman who gets on his boat, chucks the rod into the sea. He's done his bit. He can't go across the oceans and gather all the fish to come in. He, I mean, he could. But it's at some point having yaqeen that inshallah, the rizq will be there for me to take the fish in. And in the same way, he can't just leave his fishing rod laying on the side of the coast, hoping that a fish is going to catch him when there's no bait on the side. You put the effort in, Allah is coming back. He wants to check. He wants to check. Do you trust that I'm going to look after you? Even though I give you the sun every morning so that you can have the right temperature for your body to exist, you still doubt whether I'm going to look after you. Come to me and I'll look after you. Rather, what do we find? We find that we're in a society where if a young man or a young woman is working hard, nine to five is no longer a thing. It's more eight to six, eight to seven. Oh, mashallah, you're coming home at eight, nine o'clock. He's working so hard. Such a good guy. Definitely good marriage material. Trust me, if you saw me when I was popping off my 70, 80, 90 hour weeks, ask my wife. I was not good marriage material at that point. No way, but the deed was done. So that was the end of that. All of us who have worked to that level know it's not right. We know we've gone past that equilibrium. We know we're on diminishing returns. It was crazy. You suffer, you feel it, your body's aching and you feel an emptiness that I'm just, I'm just running. I'm in the rat race constantly. But we get addicted. We lose our intellect and the hunger for money and expenditure and earning takes over. There's that famous thing in the entrepreneur as well where they're like, the toughest thing is to earn your first million the easiest thing is to earn your next million and then your next and then your next and then your next bro how many millions does a man need genuinely how many millions does a man need and i always remember one of my dear uncles back in the uk may allah bless him he had a family business 25 years where they would uh, source food and ve um, uh, raw fruit and veg and then push it out to restaurants for uh, for them to use to cook Amazing business, kids doing really well, amazing schools, had a lovely house, beautiful guy. You could go to any Pakistani centre in, in the London or in the UK and he's probably donated a huge amount to it, but doesn't tell anyone. Beautiful guy. And I remember I saw him a few weeks later and I was like, how's things going? And he goes, Sadiq, we lost everything. Like, what do you mean lost everything? Like, you know when people say that, it's a bit excessive. He goes, no, dude, we lost everything. One guy in the team opened an email Email had a virus and wiped all off the systems. Invoicing system gone, supply chain gone, distributing gone. Which obviously tried to get everything sorted again, but the systems were gone. Customers getting annoyed, late deliveries, supplies not getting paid, the whole ecosystem gone. One email open, finished. This wealth that we have overnight, literally overnight, one bad email opened, one bad malicious individual, one mistake, done, finished, then what? All those years where you've been building this empire, gone. Not least when Allah says your time's up. <laughs> we forget about that one. We're more concerned about the virus that could hit our business than we are about the time where Allah says, that's it, time out, 
Let's see how you've done. Let's assess. The third point that Sayyid Fala brings forward in terms of moderation is one that not many of us would probably think would make the list. It's like a top ten of films. You're like, really? That one got in there? And this one is acts of worship. We're warned about excessiveness and extremism when it comes to acts of worship. Both not doing anything and both trying to do everything. We like to say in Shah Ramadan, especially on the nights of Qadr, are you doing a checklist a'mal or are you doing a spiritual a'mal? The conversation is what? What did you do, bro? Did you do all the du'as, yeah? Did you do du'a after You know it was Thursday as well, did you get du'a kamal in there as well, yeah? Did you do ma'an jati? You didn't do ma'an jati? Ma'an Come on, bro. Did you do 100 rakat namaz? Only 50? Come on. Did you do Josh and Kabir? Oh, wow. Du'a Abu Hamza, yeah? Did you get it done? It's like, what is happening to us? The scary thing is, is that these adaya, these du'as, these supplications, these prayers are meant to be such special moments for us. Prayer is an expression of love. It's a form of communication. It's a remembrance and glorification of Rabbul Alameen. Some even tell us that it's like a mirage, a mi'raj for the believer. It's like a spiritual ascension for them towards perfection, towards Allah. However, none of these fruits, none of these journeys towards Allah can be accomplished if you're timing yourself on how long you've got to finish your hundred rakat the master, then you can move on to Jaha Jaw Shin Kabir, then you can fit into Abu Hamza Thamali. Because maybe there's a line that kills your heart and you want to spend time on it. Ya Rabbi Raham Wa'fa Badini. Ya Sattarul Ayyub. All of these beautiful lines, back in the first couple of nights, you mentioned some of these lines from Da'a Arafah. Maybe you read that passage about how Allah has cared for you in the cradle and you just want to sit and think and reflect. But no, 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 I need to race through it, race through it, race through it, get to the end. But praying with humility and full attention, that is what is called by the teachers of ethics, is when you pray and your heart is present. We've all had it. When we offer a prayer and physically we're there, but our heart is ready at Kolachi to eat for that evening. That chicken malai boti yes. couldn't come quick enough. I need to get this maghrib out the way because they've already ordered and it's a 15 minute drive. The heart is there, the body's here. In reality, you kind of wish both heart and body were over there, right? Carry the gut as well because of the excessiveness. You have to put two hands across it. We're all familiar with that one or two prayers that we've done in our life where our heart was present, where it felt it, where you felt this ascension. And if you think back, perhaps on that day you didn't eat excessively. Perhaps you didn't speak excessively. Perhaps you took time in your wavul rather than splashing yourself as if it was like a random act that you were just told to do. It takes a lot of this build up to then stand in front of your Lord with humility and respect and love so your heart is present with Him. Moderation with regards to worship, it's to focus on quality over quantity. If we overburden ourselves in fact, it may reduce the heart's ability to remain present and more worryingly we may start to get frustrated by it. Ugh, how many of us have thought of this in, in Laylatul Qadr? I've still got to do Dahi Josh and Kabir. And I've got to work tomorrow man. Or you get to number 13, Dahi Josh and Kabir, you haven't been watching the numbers. And then you look up, 27, seriously? And then your maths is going like, is that 35 left? No, it's more, it's 60 left. No, it's more, it's like 73 left. And then you start calculating. Well, they take roughly two minutes for each one. We've all done it. We've all done it, right? Let your heart be, phys be spiritually present in this. Imam al Jawad warns on this. He's reported to say communication with Allah via the heart is more meaningful than exhausting the limbs via the physical routines of ritual worship. So clear. Don't just stand there for the sake of standing there. Let your heart stand there for the sake of reaching Allah. And I'm going to use an example that again may ruffle feathers. Fine. We may have walked over a hundred thousand steps to reach Hussein. How many of those steps were for Hussein? And how many of those steps were for the biryani at the Mokib? True or not? 
I can't wait for night two because we reach it. Finally a western toilet. How many of those steps were for Imam Hussein? Truly, and how many of those steps were to go for the chill, go for the baraza, go for the relaxation? There is no value whatever in offering voluntary acts of worship if they detract from and weaken one's obligatory acts of worship, hadith tells us. Don't compromise the obligatory for the mustahab. And why? Because the obligatory has something very, very beautiful about it that's very subtle but needs your attention in order to understand. Why is obligatory so much more valuable for the believer than mustahab? Mustahab, you can be pretty creative. You can create your own plan. You can do kind of what you want with it, right? Within the bounds of Sharia. So there is a risk maybe in that mustahab act that your mind can start to go towards, yeah, this is a nice setup that I've created. That's good for me. Whereas wajib, there are usually strict laws. There's usually a strict time and therefore you start to submit properly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know when you wear the ihram, you feel the weight of responsibility on your shoulders. I can't look in the mirror, I can't get a fly, I can't do this, I can't do that. There's a special feeling you have for those of you who've just been to Hajj, may Allah accept it. And for those of us who wish to go to Hajj in the future, may Allah grant us the Hajj through the intercession of Hussein alayhi salam. You put on that ihram and the weight of responsibility, the attention that you have to make sure you're following the commands of Allah is beautiful. It's a way to find submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's how we can go on this journey towards being an abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you would like to hear the fourth point, kindly offer salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. So the first was moderation in expenditure. The second in livelihood. The third in acts of worship. And the fourth in the appreciation and condemnation of others. Now this is a subtle one actually, because both maybe could cause some argument. When praising or even condemning someone, moderation can very quickly fly out the window. We get excited. We get really excited. Islam does not consider it acceptable to exaggerate or fake or ascribe fake attributes in order to praise someone who has perhaps helped us, even though it may come with the right intention. You may now really want to elevate their status. Some saying, no, be careful, don't be excessive in their praise. Similarly, exceeding the limits of condemnation. If someone has done something wrong, if they've spoken batil, fine, there is an etiquette and an adab to try and help correct them. Hadith says, don't do it publicly, do it privately. Privately, you've guided them. Publicly, you've ashamed them. But even if, for example, there is someone who is spouting completely incorrect beliefs, you don't need to then trash their family. Aflaha man salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Ala hubbi zahra salawat sallallahu wa sallamu alayha. Aflaha man salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Wa ila amir al-mu'mineen salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. You don't need to then go around trashing their family, trashing their background. No, just stick to the truthful point that maybe we disagree on this point and we can debate it. That's fine. But we like to become excessive. Amir al Mu'mineen reported to say praising someone with greater acclaim than they're entitled to is flattery, and allotting them less than they're just deserving is jealousy. There's a balance to be found in the way that you go and speak to people. There was one point where the Imam was praised so intensely, so much for Ba'il, and his wisdom told him, I think this guy's not being legitimate. So how does he reply? He's reported to say, I'm less than what you claim, but greater than what you feel for me in your heart. Your words are saying one thing, I know, but I'm greater than what you think is in your heart. Imagine, you know like when you think about the way the Imam Sam respond to these kind of things, like you guys are geniuses, man. How'd you come out with these one-liners? That'd be famous, it'd be like top 10 quotes, great Instagram post, anyway. It also makes us think though, 
what extents do we go to to pull compliments from people? Yes, it may be that the other person sees that you've done something and they want to compliment you. And that's a very noble thing. It's a very loving thing in society. But are we kind of twisting it a little bit and being like, you know what, if I put it out like this, then I'll be able to get a bit of, a bit of praise, a bit of a pat on the back. Previously in history, we'd see kings and caliphs spending huge money from Beit al-Mal in occasions to get poets to come in and sing their praises, even though they're completely false. And I was thinking, what's the modern day version of this? Because when I hear that, I'm like, okay, cool. I don't think I'm like that guy. I don't think I'm like the Abbasids or the Umayyads. I hope not. But I was like, what's the modern day version, perhaps, of getting people to sing your praise or to put your stuff out there? And I was like, oh, it's back again, Instagram. Here's a picture of me preparing for my majalis and doing this and doing that and doing this. Here's me at my business, at the coffee machine. Here's me entering, you know, like when you get in the lift and you're going into a tall office block, you need to film the lift going up. You're like, let me just get a little bit of, little bit of clout for this one. At least they were paying someone to do it. We're doing it ourselves. On the other hand, when falsehood or batil comes around, what is our approach with that person? We mentioned don't just discredit them completely. More worryingly, we've seen a culture, and I think, I think, at least in the UK, it's a culture within the Pakistani community that's developed, unfortunately, where we're starting to see people being labelled as muqassirs. If you pray, you're now a namazi. If you follow a mujtahid, you're now uh, uh, a, not a muqallidi, I forgot what they've called it, a taqlidi, sorry. Like, dude, just because I disagree with you, whether it's right or wrong that we should follow a marja or not. Now, the mainstream view is, yes, of course, you need to follow a marja unless you've reached the level of ishtihad. If you can't speak Arabic, good luck in reaching the level of ishtihad. That's at least the first criteria to understand that hadith and Quran correctly. But fine, okay, we disagree, no problem. We disagree. Why do you now need to label me as a taqlidi? Why is it that when namaz time comes during martyr, when I say, my dear brother, quietly in your ear, I suggest we end the program at this point, we can continue the azar after, but it's salah time. Oh, you're a namazi, you're not a martami. We're starting to get into this habit of just generalizing people with one-liners. Again, excessiveness when it comes to tarnishing other people. A fifth one that's become a massive issue and usually it's targeted at the youth but I think actually even our elders are starting to fall into this trap as the smartphone revolution starts to re reach them and take over. And that is impromptness and procrastination. People are between two camps. Either they jump hastily to conclusions with the tiniest bit of information or they wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. You're like, dude, you need to make a decision at some point. No, no, I'll wait for all of the facts to come out. One year, two years, three years, five. I'll abstain for now. You don't need it. And then they'll make a decision. No, okay, we need to be somewhere in the middle. It's like when you're driving and you've got some guy who's blasting it down at 70 miles per hour out of control of the car. Another guy driving at five miles per hour saying, I need to be careful causing accidents and traffic jams behind him. Excessiveness on either side. We need to be somewhere in the middle. And this harmonious society that we're aiming for to create this revolution for our awaited savior, these aspiring youth and inspiring elders needs to come from this balance in the middle. Because picking a fruit before it's ripe will not mean it gets to the market in perfect conditions. But equally, leaving it on the tree will not mean that someone's definitely going to pick it up and get it to the market on time either. It could go past its expiry. Humans value this balance. We're looking for balance. We're trying to find balance. If you're constantly seen as the guy who's so laid back, no one's ever going to trust you. And if you're constantly seen as the guy who's always up in your face, like, bro, I'm okay, don't worry. <laughs> Everything's fine. They'll start to think, are you doing it because you want something from me? You want me to give you something, what do you want? And usually at the airport, they want to give you a little bakshish on the side. That's why they're like, do you need any help, sir? Do you need any help? But on the one side, procrastination has become a massive challenge. On the back of short digital media, that's now easy, 10 seconds, scroll. 10 seconds, scroll. 15 seconds scroll and we need to crack it because before you know it 20 minutes has gone 30 minutes has gone an hour is gone you could have got those five tasks you needed to get done for the day 
sorted, but you're stuck. It's gone from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And now the evening's drawing to a close. And spiritually, there's a massive implication here as well. How? Spiritually, we're taught that if we commit a sin in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is like a lead time on how you, on when you ask for forgiveness. The sooner the better, basically, is a very simple principle to understand from it. You commit that sin and that regret hits you. But that regret isn't going to last for one day, two days, three days. For, it's going to peak and then it's journeying down. And at some point, it goes beyond the point where you care to react. Now what can then happen? That sin is now starting to justify itself. Ah, oh, you know what, I don't need to seek. I just made a mistake, I'll ask for forgiveness tomorrow. Tomorrow turns into the next day. The next day turns into the other, you've forgotten about it. That same opportunity comes up again, sin. Ah, oh, last time I didn't ask for forgiveness, I don't need to worry about it. I don't. And you start to let it slide without even realizing. All it took was to get up, pay some attention. Whoa. I've disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me get straight onto my perimat and at least offer a sajda asking Allah for forgiveness. And he'll see the regret and the urgency in his slave. But when he starts to see the slave not caring and drifting away and that sin turns into another, it's like a cancer tumor. If it's not treated at that very first moment, how fast does it spread through the body? Before, it's too late. The final point that we'll mention before we go into our Masa'ib is on speech and silence. In fact, it's the second last, but I think we're short on time. Speech and silence. Mad chatterboxes like me, crazy annoying. People that never give an opinion and never say anything, please, man, I think you're just judging me every single time I see you. We need to reflect on our words before we deliver them, because as we know, once they're out, they're out. Can't do anything to get them back. Amir al-Mu'mineen reported to say, beware of talking excessively because it will lead to mistakes being made in addition to exhausting the listeners. You poor guys, 10 days of me for an hour. You're gonna be finished. Happy to see me on that flight back. I'm sure you're all off to drop me to the airport and be like, through you go, bro. I think I wanna cancel your flight. Ah, come, come, we can go together. No, I'm just cancel your flight. Oh, cancel it? Oh man, I don't think my wife will agree. Those who don't observe this moderation, however, and they respond to every question. You know, you have this situation where a question comes up and you're like, yeah, I'll answer it, I'll answer it, I'll answer it. No, at some point you don't know the answer. It's okay to say, I haven't studied that. I'm not aware of this. Pass it on. And this is where that phrase comes in. If speech is valued in silver, silence is valued in gold. gold. Most books that discuss spiritual and ethical practices include chapters covering the merits of silence. Amir al-Mu'mineen has these three beautiful quotes. What the first one reported to say, reserve and silence elicit awe. Being reserved and being silent, like holding it back, elicits awe, gives off awe, gives off excellence. Beware of those whose speech is more impressive than their actions. There is no advantage in keeping quiet when a judgment is required, i.e. speak up when haq needs to be spoken up for. Just as there is no benefit in speaking out when one does not have proper knowledge. Amir al-Mu'mineen at one point was praising a brother in faith and he spoke of many of his merits. He's reported to say, in my opinion, he was prestigious because the world was insignificant to him and he freed himself from the inclinations of his stomach. He was a person who often remained silent, but who, when he did speak, reduced to silence everyone who was present. He was more eager to listen to the opinions of others than hear his own voice. Amazing guidelines for us to follow. If those are the merits that Amir al talks of one of the brothers, yeah, that's like a, Great example, Khutbatul Muttaqeen, if you haven't read it, Sermon 193, definitely read it. Amir al describing what these legends in life look like. In this case, history, uh, Imam doesn't mention explicitly who he's, met, who he's talking about, but commentators suggest that this could be Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari, one of the great companions of Ahlul Bayt alayhim 
The Holy Prophet reported to say deliverance of the faithful from sin is the result of their ability to control their tongues. Imam al rida alayhi salam, silence is one of the portals of wisdom. It attracts love and opens the path to everything that is good. Imam al sadiq narrates from Prophet Isa alayhi salam, reported to say do not speak excessively other than in the remembrance of Allah. Those who talk immoderately other than invoking Allah have their hearts hardened despite not being aware of it. So many narrations about basically just shut up. You don't always need to give your opinion. Sometimes you're sat there and there's like six conversations going around. You're like, what's happening? It's like you're at a crossroad. And because the tongue is the organ that enables this speech, Islam warns us so much about what this thing can do to us. The Quran talks about our organs being held to account and then being a witness against us or for us on Yawm al Qiyamah. But the tongue gets more mentioned than other organs. Imam al Sadiq reports that the Holy Prophet is reported to say, Allah will punish the tongue in a manner that no other body organ is to be punished. The tongue will then ask, O oh Lord, you torment, me, you torment me with a punishment that is nothing, uh, that nothing less is subjected to. To which Allah will respond, You were behind the words that caused the unjust spillage of blood much wealth being usurped and the honor of my people being violated by my majesty i will torment you in a manner that i will not subject any other organ sheikh muhammad reza tabasi a scholar from najaf is reported to have compiled two volumes on the consequences of sins that were committed as a result of the tongue being used cautioning the muslims to remain aware of all of the possibilities of issues that your tongue can get you into Backbiting, speaking that which is true behind someone's back that they wish you wouldn't speak of. And we know that line of Quran where it likens it to eating the flesh of your own dead brother. Then you have the even one, well, even worse, another awful side. Where you no longer speak things that are correct about the individual that they don't want to know, but you start to make up lies about the individual just to defame them. Rumours, rumour mills, WhatsApp forwards. There's a reason why when someone asks you for your phone, you're like, let me just make sure that WhatsApp group isn't showing at the top. I can't let them see that conversation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a revelation to Musa alayhi salam, clarifying that the backbiter who repents, note, the backbiter who repents, will be the last to enter paradise. Fine, you've repented, but you'll be in the back of the queue. And the first person to be cast into the fires of hell will be the backbiter who does not repent. How dangerous this tongue can be for us. Marriage, of course, is the exception to this rule. If you feel that this could affect someone's marriage and you need to politely say, maybe this could be an issue that comes up. And I wish to put a challenge to all, all of you my dear brothers and sisters and this is something that I'll remind us on on the night of Ashura inshallah if God gives us the tawfiq and that is that we know that the Yom al Ashura is a day of mourning and we should respect it as such and it starts from the night so from that after Maghrib on what will be Monday evening until Tuesday Maghrib when the day is over try and not talk about anything worldly greet your brothers and sisters not using salam but Allahu like al ajr etc but try not to say a word about anything worldly. Not only will it be a beautiful thing for you to be in that state of mourning for Muhammad Hussein alayhi salam, but it also, I find, shows just how much nonsense comes out of my mouth in the day. Because you start to think, oh, I'm going to say this. Do I really need to comment on the color of the wall? Like, is it really going to add value to people right now? You start to deeply reflect and you'll see how tough it is. The last, last, last point before the Masaib is hope and despair on the two sides. There are two compelling sides in our life that dominate our behavior. It's the hope of making profits that drives us to go and work this excessive amount. It's the hope of getting good grades that drives us to go and study like we've never studied before. But it's also the fear of being a failure, the fear of incurring financial loss that can drive us to not take any action. I'm too scared to take action. We need to find the middle ground between hope 
and despair. And Amir al-Mu'mini has a beautiful line where he talks about the perfect Islamic jurist, just to show the balance between hope and despair. We shouldn't fall in love with a God that is only forgiving, because then we neglect his greatness. And we shouldn't fall in love with a God that only punishes and is just, because then we neglect his love and mercy. We need to find the middle ground. Amir al-Mu'mini reported to say the perfect Islamic jurist is the one who does not let people lose hope in God being merciful does not let them remain despondent about God, about God not pardoning them and yet does not infer that Allah will grant them immunity and not hold them accountable for their misdeeds you'll find refuge in Allah but you'll find the justice of Allah Ya Allah ju judge us with your mercy and not with your justice the balance between khawf and raja two wings Give a plane one wing, it's going in one direction. Give it the other, it's going in the other. Give it both, it can find the middle ground. Only fear, you go excessive. Only hope, you go excessive. Both, you reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On this night, I thought it would be apt that we remember the women of Karbala. And I was thinking, who, who, who? And then I was like, you know what? Maybe tonight we can take our love and our mind to the one who was super composed given what she faced. Super composed. And our heart tonight goes to Umm al-Masaib, to Jabal al-Sabr, to the mother of tragedies, to the mountain of patience, to the one who led the caravan of Ali Muhammad from Karbala until they reached back to Medina through the inspiration of her phenomenal parents, Haydar al-Karrar and Fatima al-Zahra. Tonight, our hearts, our souls travel to the holy land of Asham, of Sham, Asham, to Sayyid Zainab, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayha salawat. <laughs> Zainab salam illustrates to us that in tragedy you can find a way to be moderate in your response. You can find a balance. There's a report in Kitab al-Irshad where Umar ibn Sa'ad calls out, O horsemen of Allah, mount up and receive glad tidings of paradise. Look at the way that Umar ibn Sa'ad, just in this one line, is constantly poking at Ali Muhammad, jibing at them. O horsemen of Allah, mount up and receive glad tidings of paradise. The soldiers mounted their horses and he mobilized them towards the camp of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in the afternoon. Imam Hussein alayhi salam was sitting before his tent, his sword at his side, and he nodded off brief briefly with his head on his knees. His sister Zainab alayhi salam heard the commotion and comes to her brother and says, Oh brother, do you not hear the shouting that has got closer? Al Hussein alayhi salam raises his head and says, I just saw Allah's messenger in a dream and he said to me, You are coming towards us, Ya Hussein. Zainab alayhi salam reportedly strikes her face and cries out of distress, Woe unto me. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam reported to say, You do not need to be distressed, dear sister. Be calm and may the merciful have mercy on you. We then look to the night of Ashura on the evening of the day before Imam Sajjad's father was martyred is the way the report is written. I was sitting, Imam Sajjad was sitting and my aunt Zainab salam was tending to me when my father withdrew from his companions and retired to his own tent. Huwai, the freed man of Abu Dhar al-Ghafari was with him preparing and aligning his sword. My father was reciting these incredible couplets. O oh, time away with you as a friend. How many dawns and sunsets you've had. At which your companions or seekers lay dead. 
Time will not be content with a substitute. The decision rests with the Majestic One. And every living being will have to travel the path. He repeated this two or three times and I understood it, Mama Sajjad says, and I realized its meaning. My tears choked me, but I forced them back and fought for calm. I knew that they were facing a great trial. My aunt Zainab السلام, also heard what I had heard, but she is a woman and women are tender-hearted and fearful. She could not contain her anguish. She leaped to her feet and went to his side with her robe trailing and cried, Oh woe, I wish death would release me from life. Today it is as if my mother Fatima, my father Ali and my brother Hassan have died. Oh successor of those who have gone and refuge of those who remain. Hussein looks at her and says, O oh sister, may shaitan never take away your forbearance. She replied, may my father and my mother be your ransom. O oh Abba Abdullah, you are preparing for death. May I be sacrificed for you. Hussein السلام, kept his sorrow in check, but tears filled his eyes and he's reported to say, if the sand grouse are left free at night, they will sleep. She cried, woe unto me, they will take your life by force and that breaks my heart and grieves me even more. Al-Hussein السلام, rose up, sprinkled some water on her face and then is reported to say to her, O oh sister, be mindful of Allah and take comfort in Allah's assurance. Know that the inhabitants of the earth shall die and the inhabitants of the heavens will not remain forever forever either. Everything shall perish except the countenance of Allah. He recites this line from Quran. Who created the earth with his power and who shall resurrect creation so that they return for accounting. He is one and unique. My father was better than me. My mother was better than me. My brother was better than me. And for me and them and for every Muslim, the Prophet of Allah is an exemplar. He'd console Sayyidah Zainab السلام, with these words and more. And then he said, O oh, sister, I adjure you and I ask you to respect my oath that after I am killed you will not tear your clothes for me nor scratch your face for me nor lament out loud in grief and distress over me he would escort her back to sit beside me and went out to his companions he directed them to bring their tents closer to one another and link the ropes together he instructed the men to remain between the tents and leave open only the direction from which the enemy would approach O oh, Zainab I dread to think what you must have seen in the hours that would then come O oh, Zainab I ask you which part of Ashura was the toughest O oh, Zainab was it the thirst of the children that you couldn't quench O oh, Zainab was it the passing of Qasim? O oh, Zainab السلام, was it when you bid farewell to the face of Rasulullah Ali and Al Akbar? O oh, Zainab السلام, was it when you had to bid farewell to Hussein? O oh, Zainab السلام, is it when you would watch your brother? in battle O oh, Zainab السلام, would it be when you'd see your brother fall to the floor Zainab tell me when you would go to till Zainab what would you see what would you hear what dua did you pray when you saw these men surrounding your brother Hussein would you remember your father and your mother cradling him in their lap and now you see him in the lap of another man oh Zainab oh Zainab oh Zainab tell me oh Zainab which parts of Ash 
Which part of Ashura was so difficult? Zainab is said to come out of the tents when the Imam is in his final moments. And she's reported to say, May the skies fall down to the earth. Umar ibn Sa'ad had come close to Hussein. So she said to him, O oh, Umar ibn Sa'ad, will Aba Abdullah be killed while you look on? The narrator says, I can still see the the tears of Umar soaking his cheeks and beard, then he would turn his face from her. Zainab would come out of the tents after the death of her brother. وعد الشان ومذبوح كربلا Oh my brother, oh my leader, oh my family I wish the skies would fall down to the earth And the mountains would crumble and scatter forth in the desert Oh Zainab, you'd then hear the call on the attack on the tents How did you handle that moment without Abbas? Yet after all these calamities History tells us that when you were amongst the Kufans reports and say that they saw you and had never seen a modest lady more eloquent than you. It was as if you spoke in the tongue of your father Amir al-Mu'mineen and then you delivered an outstanding sermon that shook the people. But O oh, Mu'mineen and Mu'minat, whilst the day of Ashura was so tough for Zainab, she shows moderation in her response. O oh, Mu'mineen and Mu'minat, Whilst the day of Ashura was so difficult, it's reported that when Imam Sajjad is asked what was the toughest part of this ordeal, he would not talk about Karbala, but he would say, Asham, Asham, Asham. We learn, my dear brothers and sisters, that these blessed heads of the masters of Karbala would be raised aloft on spears, and that the family would were taken captive like staves, bound in chains, mounted on top of saddleless mounts. The heat of the midday sun would burn their faces, driven across deserts and wasteland with their hands sh with their hands shackled to their necks and paraded in marketplaces. Tell me, oh my dear Zainab alayhi salam, when you would need to look up into the sky, what would you do when you saw the face of Ibn Rasulullah on top of that spear? Oh Zainab alayhi salam, this was the very face that Rasulullah would kiss. Oh Zainab alayhi salam, in these moments as you'd reflect on the day of Ashura I wonder I just wonder given that we understand post-traumatic syndrome and what you must have seen in Ashura did you start to get flashbacks when you saw the arrows going across as if you were back in Medina seeing the arrows into your brother Hassan as these arrows would engulf the bodies of the martyrs did the strike on the heads of the shuhada of Karbala remind you of the strike on the head in Kufa of Haider and Karrar and when you had to bury your dear father but oh Zainab I know that a daughter has a connection with their mother that is so prime and so unique so oh Zainab I ask you this question my dear queen <laughs> Did the smoke and the flames of Medina's door Did the smoke and the flames of Medina's door come back into your head? When you'd hear the enemies of Allah say to set alight the tents of Ali Muhammad Oh Zainab alayhi salam, I understand why your Umm al-Masaib 
I understand why you are Jebel as Sabr on the mountain of patience, Ya Zainab. Through your intercession, we ask you to allow us to be moderate in our reactions in our life. O oh, Zainab alayhi salam, when we're struggling in any of our hijab, O oh, Zainab, we ask through you to help us, O oh, Zainab. O oh, Zainab alayhi salam, on this night, we ask you to ask your brother Bab al Hawaij for all of our hajat. And given that it is the Thursday night, we say three times to Allah, no matter how much we've done, that perhaps He will be readily pleased with us by saying, Ya Sari Arrida, Ya Sari Arrida, with the tear down your eyes, Ya Sari Everyone together, Ya Sari Arrida. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon Wa sayalamu al-lazina dhalamu ayyamun qalbi yanqaliboon Wal aqibatu lil-muttaqeen Mata bin Zainab alayhi as-salam Ya Hussain Ya Hussain Ya Hussain Ya Hussain Ya Hussain Ya Hussain